Good morning, everyone. If you're visiting today, I'm R.D. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Let's bow our hearts together in prayer as we turn to God's Word. Father, once again, we thank you for your Word. For your Word, O oh Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Father, it's our desire that we could say with the psalmist, your word have we hidden in our hearts that we might not sin. I pray this morning that by the power of your spirit, your word would take deep root in our hearts and in our lives to confirm and strengthen us in everything that's good and to convict us of sin that we might more deeply love and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, endure to the end and be saved. We pray all of this to the glory of his name. Amen. Amen. You have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 9. And this morning we're going to look at the story, the account of two men. Who were they? Did you hear it when Nee was reading? Saul of Tarsus and Ananias. That's right. Not to be uh, confused with Ananias from earlier, Ananias and Sapphira. He's not around anymore. This is a different Ananias. Well, we last heard of Saul when he was ravaging the church. Do you remember that? Saul was giving himself to destroying this nascent church of Jesus Christ while pious men were lamenting and burying the murdered Stephen. Perhaps you remember that from a few weeks ago. In verse 1, we're told that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He is breathing fury, if you will. And it's an interesting thing to note that in the original Greek, the word used here for breathing is not the word breathing out, but breathing in. It is not as though Saul is merely just breathing out flames like a dragon. He is building a head of steam by inhaling. He's like huffing and puffing and trying to blow the house down. So great at his fury. This is the same Saul who watched approvingly over the stoning of Stephen. So you get this picture of the rising persecution against the early church that's already happening by Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. All the while, the good news of Jesus Christ is gaining traction and it's spreading. We've heard about how the Samaritans received the good news of Jesus with great joy. Do you remember that? And we celebrated with them. And we, and we prayed that we would have hearts like the Samaritans that would warmly receive this good news of Jesus Christ. By last week, we heard of the Ethiopian eunuch. A man who was not on anyone's radar for the saving purposes of Jesus Christ. And yet the gospel gained traction with him. And so we are already seeing this pattern in the early part of Acts where two things happen simultaneously. The church of Jesus Christ comes under persecution and the gospel grows. Far too often we as Christians live our lives nervous. Trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit as though the ongoing life of the church depends on us, on our ability to lobby political sway, on our ability to choose the right tick box on a ballot. And while those things certainly are important and have their place, ultimately and finally, we see that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will endure till he returns to receive his bride. Jesus said, not even the gates of hell will ever prevail against it. That'd be a good moment for an amen. All right, verse 2. We're told that Saul has been to visit the high priest and he's now on his way to Damascus. And he has in hand an arrest warrant, an extradition order, if you will, to bring Christians back to Jerusalem so that they can face the music. Look, we're seeing that the gospel is spreading like wildfire to the point that it's already made its way all the way to Damascus, this ancient city. 
There are Christians there, and Saul is determined that they need to be brought to justice. He is so determined to stamp out this movement at its earliest stage. I was, I mean, this is going to be a huge surprise to some of you, but yesterday morning I got up really early and went golfing. <laughs> um, and as I was golfing, I was teamed up with this group of other guys that I didn't know. I was just golfing by myself. And uh, midway through the round, they asked, so what do you do for a living? I told them I'm a pastor. And they were like, oh, that's cool. But you could tell they didn't think it was that cool. <laughs> and they said, so do you have your sermon ready to go? And I'm like, yeah, I got it all set. And the guy's like, what's it about? I'm like, okay, so 50-minute sermon reduced to a sentence in a way that matters to a guy who doesn't care. And I don't know if it was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but I said to him, I said, listen, we're preaching through the book of Acts. We're on Acts chapter 9. He's like glazed over. He has no idea what I'm talking about. The conversion of St. Paul, who was then called Saul, still nothing. I said, but you know what the point was? The point of this passage is that God can save the least likely. That one person who by all appearances has gone too far, God's saving grace, when the Lord Jesus Christ sets his affection upon someone and sets out to save them, there is nothing that they can do to outrun his saving mercy. Like I was like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so what we see here is this picture of this least likely man to be met with the loving call of Jesus. You know, this is a point that was not lost on St. Paul later in life, Saul who became St. Paul. In first Corinth, in, sorry, in First Timothy chapter 1, he was reflecting on his life and he said that the grace of God came even to me, the chief of sinners. Perhaps Saul was a pretty bad dude, right? But I think every Christian man or woman could say the same. When I think back on my life, I may not have been the worst guy who ever lived, but I was as bad as I could have been. I had rejected God. I was living in open rebellion against my Lord and King. I was a chief of sinners. That's what Paul says. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he's referring to his own apostolic calling, he refers to himself as one untimely born. If you have a weak stomach or you're queasy, don't look up the literal original Greek on that one. Paul was very clear that he had done nothing to deserve the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In fact, quite the opposite was true. You know, friends, I think this speaks to at least two things in our lives this morning. The first thing to consider is maybe you're a Christian man or woman, and you've been praying earnestly for the salvation of a loved one or a friend. And you, like the persistent widow, continue to bring this to the Lord, saying, Lord, would you in your mercy save my husband, save my wife, save my children, save my cousin, my nephew, my co-worker, my friend, whomever it may be. And you're looking at it after a long time of praying and you're saying, there's no reason for me to believe that that person will ever repent. Friend, have hope. God in Jesus can save Saul. God in Jesus can save your loved one. Why, if you were a Christian in this earliest church and you were praying for the salvation of Saul, that would seem like mission impossible. This man who was bent on killing you and all of your friends for your profession of Jesus Christ. And yet God saves him. I was trying to think of a modern equivalent, and I thought, you know, it would be something like if the head of Boko Haram were to bow their knee and repent and be born again and become a Christian man instead of raining terror on Christians in Nigeria. It would be something like that. It would be something like if the head of the caliphate of ISIS were to be confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ and bow his knee to Jesus and be born again. 
Friends, don't miss how profound this is. Last week, we saw the Ethiopian eunuch, who was the finance minister of Ethiopia, saved and born again. What if you were reading the newspaper tomorrow morning and you heard that Christia Freeland was now a born-again Christian? Professing faith in Jesus Christ. No one is beyond the scope of God's redemptive purposes in Jesus find it really moving, sorry, because I see it in the account here in, in, in Saul's conversion. But you know, I see it when I look out over our church too. There are many of you that I remember before you were saved. I remember when you were born again. And I remember you telling me stories about how you would have never imagined that you'd be in a place where you would love and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here you are. Praise God that he saves Saul and he saves the least likely. That's the first thing to take away. The second thing to take away, so the first one is there's hope for everyone that you're praying for. There's hope for everyone in the world. Pray that they'd be saved. The second thing is for you yourself. Look, if you are sitting here this morning and you've been dragged here against your will just to appease your spouse, or because your parents dragged you out of bed when you'd rather be sleeping in on a Sunday morning, or maybe you are just in general exploring Christianity, but you're struggling with bowing your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can come up with a laundry list, a million different reasons why God's saving purposes should not include a person like you. Things that you've done. Things that you're currently doing. And you would say, there's no way God could save someone like me. Behold, Saul. Or maybe you're a Christian man or woman here today and you're struggling with assurance. You know that you have been saved. You profess Jesus Christ as your Lord. You've been baptized. But Satan, the accuser, has been harassing you on overtime. Been reminding you of your sin. Reminding you of those things in your past. And he's like, well, if you did that, there's no way you can truly be saved. He's trying to rob you of the joy of your salvation. Saul killed Christians led the charge in persecution against the church. And yet God in Jesus Christ saved him, all his grace. Maybe you're a Christian man or woman and you're struggling with assurance, not just because of things in your past, but because of things that are going on in your life presently. Look, I think this is a really important pastoral point. Um, Far too often when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, when God grants us the gift of belief and faith and trust in him, when we're born again. We treat it as though the cross has paid for every sin that we've committed up to that point where we responded to the altar call. And then from that point forward, man, we'd better get our own stuff together because we've been forgiven and now we need to live perfect. You know, no one would ever say that, but functionally that's the way we live. I know growing up, in a Christian home and in a Christian church, I responded to hundreds of altar calls. I was born again like 15 times because I was scared, right? And, And what we need to do is embrace this truth that God in Jesus has paid the price for all of our sins both before that moment of conversion, they are all forgiven, and for every sin that we could ever commit between here and glory. It isn't that God saves you in Jesus and gives you another chance to try to get it right. God saves you in Jesus and gives you a new self, a new life, one that is hidden in Christ, clothed in his righteousness. When you sin and you will, those sins are out of character for you because you are a new person in Christ. They are under the blood of Jesus. 
Paul, Saul, who was converted here, who later became St. Paul, he also wrote Romans 7. Romans 7, where he said, the very things that I don't want to do, I do. The very things that I do, I don't want to do. Who will rescue me from this body of death, O wretched man that I am? But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, if, if God can save Saul, God can not only save your friends and your loved ones, but God can save you. You can trust him. Here we have the conversion of one of the greatest men in history, Saul of Tarsus. Verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. So remember, Saul is on a mission here. He's on a witch hunt to stamp out the Christians. He has the authority of the high priest on the papers in his hands. He was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. So we're told from other accounts that this is around noon in the heat of the day. The sun is high in the sky and yet there is such a blinding light brought to bear on Saul that it makes everything just a wash of white light. Blinding. It's Jesus coming to him. The resurrected Jesus appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. And you know, friends, Jesus comes to each and every one of us, not often in blinding light, but sometimes in ways that are equally dramatic. Sometimes in ways that are just quiet, but profound. How did the Lord Jesus Christ come to you? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the process leading up to it? I remember it well. I was, <laughs> I was four years old. Four years old. I was in a church service. I heard the gospel presented. I remember being grieved over my many sins at four years of age. No, sincerely, I was. And, and I knew that I needed a Savior. I knew that I needed someone that would save me. And at four years of age, the Holy Spirit granted me the faith to believe and to throw myself upon the mercy of Jesus. I remember how Jesus came to me. Sean Lee told you a brief report on our sports camp. You know, we call it a sports camp, but that's just to get kids through the door. Really, it's a Jesus camp. We asked you to pray that many children would get saved. And as the gospel appeal was put forward for these children on Thursday and Friday, Dan tells me that 34 of the children responded to the gospel by raising a hand, coming forward and praying. Were all of their conversions real? I don't know. Jesus said some, soil fall, some, some seed falls on good soil, some on other. But... I know when I was younger than that, mine was real. Jesus came to them while kicking a soccer ball at a sports camp. Praise God. So Jesus comes to Saul in a blinding light. And we're told in verse 4 that Saul's response is that he literally balls up, falls to the ground, he's overwhelmed, he's undone. Now, for Saul, this falling to his knees is literal. For each and every one of us that responds to the Lord Jesus Christ, we fall to our knees figuratively. We're going to see that as we move forward. Okay, verse 4 goes on. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Commentators rightly point out that there are well over a dozen times in Scripture where a name is used twice in addressing a person. And in those moments, there is a intimacy and a tenderness communicated. Can you think of other times in Scripture where someone's name is used twice in addressing them? What about in Genesis chapter 22? When Abraham takes Isaac up onto the top of Mount Moriah, 
And in obedience to the Lord God, he has bound his one and only son. He has laid him on the altar. He has the knife in hand and he's about to plunge it. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Abraham, Abraham. What about Moses in chapter, in chapter 3 of Exodus, where Moses is tending to the flocks of Jethro in Midian? And the Lord God, Yahweh, appears to him in a burning bush. And what does he say to Moses? Can you guess? Moses, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy. Samuel, under the tutelage of Eli, is trying to get to sleep at night. And the voice of the Lord comes to him and says, Samuel, Samuel. Do you see the pattern that's emerging? David, after the death of his traitorous, treasonous son, Absalom, David is brokenhearted. And what does he say? He says, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, would it have been me that would have died instead of you? Do you hear the tenderness in using someone's name twice in address? Jesus tenderly rebukes Martha. You know, Martha and Mary, you know that account? And he says, Martha, Martha, what are you doing? When Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed all your prophets. I, I wish I was a mother hen. I'd like to gather you up like little chicks. From the cross, Jesus cries out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Twice. Conversely, in the Sermon on the Mount, right at the end, Jesus cautions and he warns and he says, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord. What's he saying? He's saying that there will be some who come to me on the last day and they're trying to feign an intimacy that they never had with me. He's, he said, they're going to they're come to me saying, Lord, Lord, this intimate address. But I'm going to say to them, get away from me. I never knew you. You see, the repetition of the name twice is the picture of loving intimacy. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, resurrected, glorified, ascended into heaven, appears to Saul and says to him in Hebrew, Saul, Saul. Look, you're reading along in this account and it should be absolutely staggering that the Lord Jesus Christ has any love for Saul at all. That's not how lords and masters operate. People who rebel against them get squished like bugs. They don't get loved. And yet the Lord Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Look, Jesus Christ comes to us, and he comes to us in love, even and especially when we don't deserve it. He knew me, and yet he loved me. That's the posture of the Christian man. Saul hears his name twice in Hebrew, and then he hears a question. Why are you persecuting me? Verse 4. Here you see the inextricable link that Jesus makes between himself and his church. Do you notice that Jesus doesn't say to Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting my church? What does he say? Why are you persecuting? Me. Me. And so it's always been the case that to stand against the church of Jesus Christ is to oppose God. To seek to bring injury to Christians is to injure the body of Christ. There's no dis difference or distinction made. You know, that ought to serve as a warning to anyone in the world who persecutes the church. But it also serves as a source of hope and encouragement to every Christian who's ever been persecuted. 
Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? All right, verse 5. And Saul's response, he says, who are you, Lord? Well, this is the first of two responses to the Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to see in our passage today. The first one here from Saul, who are you, Lord? So you can only imagine, Saul is riding along, he's got his marching orders tucked into his Levi's pocket or whatever, and he's going to, on a hunt for Christians. Blinding light, knocked off his horse, laying there in a ball, voice comes out of heaven. Would you guys be freaked out yet? Voice comes out of heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his answer is, I don't know what's going on or who you are, but clearly you are master over everything. That's how profound this moment is. Who are you, Lord? Jesus is Lord. This is the consistent profession of Christians throughout the book of Acts and throughout time. And Saul, in this moment, recognizes it. He says, you are, I don't know who you are, but I know that you're Lord. Lord over my actions, Lord over my thoughts, Lord over my finances, Lord over my practices, Lord over everything. Jesus answers and says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And so in this moment, Saul is confronted with this truth. Saul has to, in a moment, take this all in. He thought he had been doing the Lord's will by killing and persecuting Christians. He thought he'd been doing the right thing. But now in the presence of Jesus Christ, he realizes that he was wrong. Everything he believed in, everything he invested in, was actually resisting the Lord of heaven and earth. You know, all around us we see people who are set against Jesus. They are rebelling. They are like sheep without a shepherd. They're going their own way. And because we are polite Canadians, we look at them and we think, gosh, maybe they're just misguided. Maybe they are merely misled. But bless their hearts, right? No. Saul is blinded and brought to his knees. He is balled up on the ground like you would be from a gut punch. Because he's come to the realization that he wasn't simply misguided. He was opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord and the master of everything. Paul has to deal with this. Saul has to deal with this. He has to realize that everything up to this point has been the height of folly. You see, we've been tracking through this account in Acts and we've seen that Jesus has been raised from the grave. He has ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of power. We see that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. And this crushing truth comes to bear on Saul. Like a two-year-old child shaking its fist at WWE legend Andre the Giant... He's been resisting the most powerful Lord God of the universe. So the Lord instructs him, because that's what lords do. Look at verse 6. Lords hold all prerogatives. They get to tell you what to do. And so in verse 6, he says to him, Rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And so... Saul's like, okay, you do what the Lord says. I, I want to pause for a moment on this. Um, Saul, who in a couple of chapters will be named St. Paul, is going to go on later on upon years of reflection from this moment. And he's going to write Romans chapter 8. Paul's going to say, 
all things work together for good. What, what does he mean? He's going to have years of reflection from this conversion moment. And he's going to say, man, nothing in my life was wasted in the great economy of God. He's going to look at it and he's going to say, the all things included even my vile actions against the church. How does that work? Well, see, for Saul, for St. Paul, God was able to take the vileness of his persecution and murder of Christians and use it for good. Because through it, Paul was stripped of any sense of deserving to be saved. He was stripped of any sense that God was pretty lucky to have a guy like him. Through even his most vile acts redeemed, Saul, St. Paul, was pressed into depths of the riches of grace of Jesus Christ that he could have never known otherwise. And so he writes Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. He knows that the all things that God is working together for good include not only his vile actions and experiences, but they include also all the skills, all of the giftings that he had. We've already looked at Saul and seen that he was a student of Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi of the time. Saul excelled in academics beyond all of his fellows. He was a leader. God was able to take all of those things, his disposition, his temperament, and use them for his good. Here's a little side note that I think is really important. By every measure known to man, Saul of Tarsus had it all together. He was a great man. He was respected. He had a good reputation. He was admired. He was young. He had his stuff together. He was on a trajectory of his career that would take him fast track to CEO like he was the man. Jordan Peterson would have said he was awesome. This guy like makes his bed every day, right? He's awesome. By every measure, Saul of Tarsus had it all put together and yet he needed to be saved. Don't miss that. In all of his togetherness, he was still opposing God. And this is a caution to each and every one of us. No matter how put together, no matter how capable you are or you may think you are, you still need to be saved and converted by Jesus. Okay, verse 7. So there were men who were traveling with Saul and they stood around speechless. They heard the voice, but they didn't see anyone. So in the account, they were confronted with the exact same experience as Saul, but they left unchanged. Have you ever wondered why some people, when presented the gospel, they bow their knee to Jesus, they're born again, they become new creations in Christ, and yet other people, when presented with the exact same facts, they leave unchanged? Well, biblically, it's because we're told that God gives us eyes to see and ears to hear. So if you're praying for a loved one that you want to see saved, pray that God would grant them the eyes to see. Pray that earnestly. If you're hovering around Christian faith and you're saying, I'd really like to believe, but I just don't know if I can take the leap, stop trying to believe and pray. Ask that God would grant you the faith and the eyes to see. God always answers prayers like that. Verse 8, so Saul is helped on his way to Damascus. Verse 9, he's blind. He has no food or drink for three days. Paul is given three days to contemplate what all of this meant. 
His whole world has been flipped upside down. The deck of his life has been shuffled to the point that everything that he used to hate, he now loves. This man who was committed to destroying and killing the church of Jesus Christ will now go on missionary journeys at great peril and give his entire life to shaping and feeding the sheep of Jesus Christ, not only in his lifetime, but throughout time. Isn't that remarkable? This is how deep and profound his change was. We know that it's true. Anytime we change our mind about something deep and profound, we have to go through a process of betraying our own expectations. If we hold too tightly to our own patterns of thought and behavior, then we can never truly repent and never truly be changed. See, Saul is saved, he's converted, he's born again. But then he will spend the rest of his life working out and writing about what it means to have a Lord, to have a Savior. And the same is true for us. The Holy Spirit of God causes us to repent and believe and be born again in a moment. But then we spend the rest of our entire lives appropriating and applying that Lordship and saving power of Jesus to our entire life. It's a process. Christian theologian types call it salvation and sanctification, both works of the Spirit. You are saved, you are justified before God as a work of the Spirit in a moment. You are caused to be born again when you trust in Jesus Christ. And then you spend the rest of your life applying that truth by the power of the Spirit. So, for Saul, what does it mean to have a Lord? What does it mean to have a Savior? Well, we're not told explicitly, but it's clear from what he does. He pulls those orders from the high priest out of his back pocket and he rips them up. He no longer serves the high priest. He serves Jesus Christ as his master. He heeds and obeys his direction. Friends, if you are newly saved or newly born again, what allegiances do you need to swap? What do you have to change? Well, that's the process of sanctification. All right, so that's Saul of Tarsus. Let's look at verse 10, and we're going to move more quickly through this one, okay? I promise. We're introduced to another guy named Ananias, and he's also given a vision from the Lord. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he responds to the Lord. And what does he say? Say it out loud. Here I am, Lord. What a beautiful answer. Friends, this is the foundational definition of a Christian man or woman. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to you and your response is, yes, Lord, here I am. Ready to do the master's will. Verses 11 to 12. The Lord says to him, rise up and go to the street called Straight and to the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Verse 12. And he has seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. That's what the Lord told him to do, right? Verse 13 and 14. Ananias is like, "Uh, Lord, are you sure about that? Like Saul, like that guy, the guy that's been notoriously going around killing Christians, that's the guy you want me to go to? you got to imagine the fear and the dread that was upon Ananias in this moment, and rightly so. But behold the courage and the trust that emerges. Verse 15, the Lord says, yep, go. He says, he's a chosen vessel of mine. 
And so Ananias does it. Look, here is the process of Christian thought. The Lord tells you to do something in his word, and you do it. Far too often, Christian men and women hamstring themselves with intellectual gymnastics, trying to rationalize, trying to reason, trying to weigh options, pros and con lists, as long as my arm. Do what the master tells you. Sometimes it will seem counterintuitive. But as Christians, we are not pragmatists. We're convictional. We believe that God is good. His will is good. His word is good. And it's best for human flourishing. So we obey it. Look, you see it throughout Scripture. God often calls his people to do the opposite of what they think they should do. Do you remember the account of God paring down the armies of Israel before a battle so that he would be glorified? Who goes to battle and pairs down their army? But the Lord demanded obedience, and he honored it. I mean, there are so many other examples, but consider the cross itself. What a counterintuitive way to show your glory and your power. And yet Jesus was obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross, and so God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord. That's it. Ananias looks at it, he's like, Saul's going around killing people. I don't think that's a good idea, Lord. The Lord's like, no, no, you got to go. I have a plan for him. And Ananias is like, okay, let's go. You do what the Lord tells you. You're trying to figure out a pathway forward in your life. And you got your pros and cons list out. You're trying to figure it out. Stop doing that. Just say, what does the Lord want me to do? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added unto you. Do what the Lord tells you to do. He'll bless it. That's why Christians do countercultural things like love their enemies and pray for them. Give 10% and more of their income to the Lord's work. That's why they bear the social scorn and stigma of the cross. Because we obey the Master. And we trust that His will and His word are good. Verse 16, the Lord gives Ananias a sneak peek into the importance that St. Paul is going to, uh, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to play. He says that he will be a vessel used to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. And verse 16, uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? The Lord tells Ananias that Paul, Saul, is going to suffer much. It's a reminder to us that the Lord's call on us isn't always easy. And we often shortchange Christians when we tell them things like, when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, it is just going to make your life awesome. You're just going to be tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim. Everything's going to be wonderful. Never have any hardship. No, no, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. Look, if you are looking at your life and you're faced with hardship, there are at least two possibilities. Maybe things are hard because you're not obeying the Lord and you need to repent. That's one thing. Or maybe your life is difficult precisely because you are doing the thing that God has called you to do. Saul is converted, becomes the Apostle Paul, lives a life where he seeks to follow God's direction, and it winds him up shipwrecked multiple times, whipped, stoned, beaten, and left for dead. But with an overwhelming sense of purpose. A purpose in a life that justifies his existence. That's what you get. Paul's going to suffer many things for the sake of Christ and his calling. Verse 17. So Ananias Departs, enters the house, lays hands on Saul, and greets him as a brother. Verse 18, the scales fall from Paul's eyes. 
He received his sight at once and he was baptized. And verse 19, at the very end of verse 19, it says, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. So Saul is newly born again. He's been given eyes to see. He's baptized. And then he needs to be discipled. Can't overstate the importance of active discipling. It takes the form of small groups. It takes the form of personal relationships. It takes the form of personal discipline. Reading your Bible, praying every day. It's in those moments of discipling that you will do exactly what we said earlier, where you will take those truths of the saving grace of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus Christ, and you will apply them and you'll appropriate them to your life. You'll grow in godliness. Saul had to be discipled by the guys. And so do you. I know I need to close. There's a barbecue waiting for us. But I'd be remiss if I let this moment pass. Perhaps you're still thinking about the very first point that we made from this passage. You have a million reasons why God can't save someone like you. Maybe you're a Christian and you still hold on to all of those reasons. The enemy uses them to bludgeon you and beat you up and rob you of your joy and assurance. We're going to pray right now that God would grant you the faith to trust in Jesus and cause you to be born again. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you that in this conversion of Saul, we see that saving work belongs to you and to you alone. Father, if you can set your affection upon Saul in Jesus, then there is no one in this room that is beyond the scope of your redemptive purposes in Jesus. Would you even now grant each and every one of us eyes to see, tender hearts and consciences, cause us to believe, to know that we are sinners and to trust in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would cause people here this morning to be born again. If that's you this morning, you can just pray a simple prayer. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just pray a simple prayer like, Jesus I do believe that you're Lord. I bow my knee to you now. I believe that God raised you from the dead and that you are my Savior. Friend, if there's anything in you that is inclining you to pray that, that's the Holy Spirit of God at work in you, causing you to believe and be born again. If you're a Christian man or woman and you're struggling with assurance, I pray now that the word of God by his spirit would silent the vo- silence the voice of the accuser who's seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. That you'd be granted such deep conviction and trust in Jesus that it would be unshakable. Your hope would be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.